we're going to look at Matthew chapter 1, we're going to look at the first bit, because <clears throat> thanks, thanks for your joy and enthusiasm, as expressed publicly in the front row. Um, <laughs> here we are going to look at it, and you're going to be stunned. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm also finding it hard. <laughs> That's a very, very interesting piece of scripture. I mean, it really does begin in the New Testament. Begins Matthew's Gospel, and it just seems so odd, doesn't it? What on earth is going on here as Matthew introduces an account of the birth of Jesus? I mean, if he wanted people to listen, we'd have thought he said something a bit more interesting. No? Well, that kind of shows our distance in time and culture. Because it's essential, it's absolutely crucial. It's all about the human forebears, the lineage of Jesus, who is then introduced to us as the Messiah, and verse 21, the Saviour from sin for the world. And that's where all this is heading. So Matthew 1 1 starts off with, you know, what we, you know, oh dear, here we go, beginning of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And you think, oh, this is going to be a good read. But, but actually, it's foundational and crucial. To Matthew introducing Jesus to us as the one who's the saviour of the world. So perhaps to our eyes it looks like a lot of very tedious and boring detail, getting followed by a bombshell. But in an Eastern context, as in a South Wales Valleys context, genealogies, a list of a person's forebears, are very, very important indeed. So genetic inheritance is crucial to working out in that pattern of in that pattern of consciousness, that culture, where a person fits. No less so than where the long foretold and long awaited Messiah, who will fulfil Old Testament prophecy by, amongst other things, coming from a certain house and in a certain lineage, is concerned. It matters. Because it shows us not only who he is, but also how he fulfills the law and the prophets in the role of God's anointed saviour. And it tells us a lot more than that about what he is for and what he does. Genealogy maketh the man, right? In near mid ancient near Middle Eastern and current Middle Eastern society, never more so than in the Saviour's case. Genealogy there are a number of singular features in this genealogy that Matthew gives us for Jesus. Two today seem particularly worthy of note. Firstly, Jesus is the point of history. Jesus is the point of history. Now that's a huge and a bold statement if ever there was one, isn't it? So, so how can I justify it? Well, there are two ways in particular that Scripture communicates truth. Two ways in particular, leading ways, okay? First, there's structure, and secondly, there's content. And there's a lot more to be said than that. You know, there's a literary genre, right? There's, there's speech acts. There's all sorts of implicit communication that goes on in written text. Because okay? we can get a lot more complicated if we want to. But for our general purposes, structure and content tell us a lot. Two big things to get your head around, structure and content, in this passage of Scripture. Structure? Well, it goes by four teams. <coughs> You know, you know, it, it, it makes the point explicit, doesn't it? Thus there were 14 generations between this one and that one and that one. Yeah? It makes that point. Why? <coughs> well, David, <coughs> very much the key to this, Matthew is introducing to us Jesus as king over the kingdom of God. Yeah? That's what Matthew does a lot of. The parables of the kingdom and so are in Matthew. Teaching about the kingdom of God is in Matthew. Jesus coming to fulfill Old Testament prophecy and bring together the kingdom of God is in Matthew. Matthew's big big theme, the kingdom of God. And David is the prototype, anointed king over the united monarchy of the people of God. The forerunner of the kingdom of God, Old Testament Israel. He's the one who brought the united monarchy together. He's the one who established, if you like, the kingdom of God on earth with a human king in the Old Testament. And 14 is very important for David. Why is that? Because David's name has got three letters in it, a, a sprinkling of vowels. Now the sprinkling of vowels doesn't matter because originally... Hebrew is written, and properly, Hebrew is written without any vowels. The vowels are not there, you guess. Okay? Which makes it a really interesting language to learn. Can you imagine? 
power. But the name of David has three basic letters in it. Dalit, well, Dalit, okay? There it is on the wall. Can you see? The things I give you in this. Right, David. But each Hebrew letter has got a number associated with it. We know they played a lot of games with the letters and the numbers and adding things up. Happy? Here's how it goes. Here is the Hebrew alphabet, and here are the letters, and here are the numbers that go with. So Aleph is one, Beit is two, Gimel is three, Dalek is four, Wow is six. So if you've got a Dalek, that's four, and if you've got a Wow, that's six, and if you've got a Dalek, that's four again, I should have done it the other way, yeah? Two fours are eight, eight and six is, how many? Fourteen. Fourteen. So interestingly, this guy who wants to tell us that Jesus is the actual king over the people of God, of whom David was a foreshadowing and a forerunner, has given us groups of 14, which add up to the name of David. So David's all over it. Is that making sense? Interesting people in Hebrew, aren't they? Matthew's concerned with 14 generations because 14 is the numerical value of the Hebrew letters forming the name of David. And Matthew, writing for his Jewish audience, goes to some lengths to edit his material to put people in, or leave people out rather, of the lists of people who went before, to give him those groups of 14. So in the second section of the genealogy, Matthew 1, 6b to 11, three kings of Judah, Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah have been completely omitted to give him the 14. It's a stylistic thing, you see? Incidentally, don't ever go through the genealogies in the Old Testament and add up the, the ages of the people and try and get you know, the age of the earth from that. Right? Because consistently, biblical genealogies put some in and leave some out. It's like my granny's memory of our family history. You know? Okay, It's been done for other reasons than tell you how old the earth is. Let's not be too silly about that. So, Matthew... Writing for people who understood these things, who understood how their language worked and what using 14s in this way is intended to convey, he gets his message across that Jesus is coming to inaugurate the kingdom of God. Not a rework political united monarchy when the Romans kicked out the way David was involved in things. None of that, but Jesus coming as the one who was to come, the end time Messiah, the king over the kingdom of God, who has his intention, verse 21, is not bloody revolution, political reformation, but the forgiveness of all his people's sins. That's what his name means. <coughs> so he's given us this breakdown into 14s of the name of David. The name of David is all over that. And then he says, yeah, but we're going to call him Jesus. And the name we're going to call him Jesus is then because he's going to save his people from their sins. And that's how the kingdom of God is going to be established. Making sense? <laughs> be happy about it. So Matthew wants his predominantly Jewish readership in absolutely no doubt as to who Jesus is, and he reinforces that through the structure of 14 that he's got there. Three sets of 14, which highly effectively highlight the three men who represent the three pillars of the theology of Matthew's Gospel. Because there are three guys who are picked out in that breakdown of the genealogy in 14. Three guys in that group. Abraham, David, the Messiah. Those three guys, the high points of history, all pointing towards the coming of Jesus from your account and fulfills all that. Is that making sense? Abraham is viewed biblically as the father of the faithful, the one who received the promise, he became the father of the faithful, and the one from whom all those who become the historic Old Testament people of God will spring. He's the founder. And then David. The one who bore the responsibility and succeeded in achieving the unity of these people as a political entity, who brought a nation state promised to Abraham into being. Just as the genealogies of Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 unify history between major figures, in that case, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Matthew's genealogy now unifies the defining periods of Israel's history by these three people pointing them to Jesus. Okay. So Jesus now coming to inaugurate the end time kingdom of God. Big theme of Matthew's Gospel, there it is. In this genealogy. 
What's in the content of it? And then we look at the structure, we look at the big overview, the groups of 14s, there are these three pillars showing that Jesus is the point of history. What about the context? <coughs> Fascinating this. Verse 1. We haven't got beyond verse 1 much yet, have we? <coughs> this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This is the genealogy. And, uh, let me just read the Greek, because it's very interesting. Biblos, the book. Genesis. What does that sound like? Genesis. The book of the Genesis of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. <coughs> now, of course, the names in, in Matthew's genealogy, names like Judah and Ruth and David and Isaiah and Hezekiah and Josiah, they're going to evoke immediately for Matthew's Jewish audience a whole range of stories they learned about from their their heritage, from the early days of their childhood that had been learning these things, things, evoking great heroes of the past, David, Josiah. Matthew reminds his audience of the ultimate hero of Israel's history, to whom all these pointed. It's all about Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Matthew makes his, his point clear in, in these opening words, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, literally the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ. He gets that phrase, as Matthew, from, from passages in Genesis. The book of the generations of. It, it happens in, gen, in Genesis, in the foundation of everything. Genesis 2.4, Genesis 5.1, Genesis 10.1. But Matthew uses this phrase, Biblos Genesios Jesu Christi, Christus. It, it's <coughs> a stunning sort of harking back to there's the foundation of the Old Testament, here's the foundation of God's new covenant. contrast. And there's a stark, really stunning contrast. Because <clears throat> genealogies like those in Genesis typically list a person's descendants. Those who come from him. After that phrase. But this one lists his ancestors. It's the other way. Going the other way. And Matthew's point is very profound. So much is Jesus the focal point of history that his ancestors kind of depend on him for their meaning. Does, does that make sense? It's running the other way. The meaning of Abraham and the meaning of David and the meaning of these guys is found in Jesus. The genealogy runs the other way. Does that make sense? Did I make that part clearly? Are you, are you, are you tired and ill and falling asleep? Because, or, or am I doing it to you? Jesus is the one who makes sense of it. And that's why we read the Old Testament with our New Testament spectacles on, isn't it? He's the one who makes sense of it. As Craig Keener points out in his The Gospel of Matthew, a socio-rhetorical commentary, I'm going to write a book on these days and I call it My Book on Such and Such, because it's going to sound a lot easier than some of these guys in there. It's a great book. He points out all this amounts to is that God sovereignly directed the history of Israel and preserve David's life, not for their reasons, but because of his plan to send Jesus. He's doing all that stuff. He's working history to this point. He's preparing people to a point where the Son of God will be sent to be the Saviour of the world. He's bringing history to a point. And the point is Jesus who saves his people from their sins. This is the genesis of three points. You know, there's, <coughs> there's absolutely no holding back um, at the beginning of, of Mark's Gospel. A bold declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you ever give Mark's Gospel to a Muslim, it's good well back, because that's what you need to do next. You can see that that book starts with an explosion. The beginning of the Gospel. About Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Bang! And there's absolutely no holding back at the beginning of Luke's Gospel. There's just a bold declaration of the historical facts and the absolute authenticity of the historical Jesus. No holding back. And there's no holding back at the beginning of John's Gospel that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst who beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Whack. And there is none here in this Jewish Gospel this is the beginning of the gene. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. Bang! Verse one. 
Can you imagine all those? Did you, did you see the film on the telly last night? Did you see all those Jewish leaders? You didn't see it. Now they were driving on the boat, maybe, throwing things in the air and kicking off because of Jesus. Yeah? Night is not bad enough. You want to kick off, you kick off. This is your truth. Get it. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. That's what you do over here. Right in your face. No holding back. Now bear in mind that Orthodox Jews of his day would react extremely violent to the violently to that assertion. This is not cool Christianity in Matthew's world. Jesus Christ is the appointed anointed saviour of his people, fulfilling millennia of Old Testament promises that God would come to earth to save his people. It's Jesus, says Matthew, up front. Just imagine kicking off. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Queen Dawid, the son of David. Just improving that. Just give me a second. Here it is. Groups of 14. He's the son of David. And, and we've been alerted to the fact that that's what he's going to be doing because he tells us in verse 1. Rightful heir to the, his Jewish throne, to the throne over the people of God. Now there have been all sorts of prophecies saying that Messiah is coming, he's going to be in the house and lineage of David and so on. Interestingly, interestingly, a number of people I've heard have said this, <coughs> Jewish leaders who stayed with Judaism didn't even try to disprove that. They didn't even attack him at that point. Matthew opens and closes the genealogy with a title for Jesus that is significant but rare in his gospel, Jesus Christ, the Messianic up in verse 1, verse 18. Here he is. This is the genealogy. This is the Genesis. Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Bringing the people of God together. The Messiah had to be, oh, oh incidentally, he was, he was quite possibly the first Gentile convert to Judaism, wasn't he? You know, he was an idolater in of the Colonies. God spoke to him and said, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I'll show you. I'll make it your great nation. Who first began? Who the pagan first began to follow the God of the Bible, Abraham? There he is. So the Messiah then comes from David, from Abraham, stands in that flow of Old Testament tradition, is the point to which history is being directed. And the structure and the content of points to all of that. But that is very far from being the full story that Matthew conveys, very far from being in its completeness the theme of his gospel. Because whilst he is very keen to show that Jesus is the point of history, that he is the one who, who, who is the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, there's something else he wants to tell us about what sort of saviour this guy's going to be. And Matthew is big on this in his gospel, which given that he's writing for Jewish people who would have found this very hard to take, it's a big deal. Um, <coughs> but another disaster of Christmas cards this year. I did at some point look for a Christmas card list, I used to have once, and I found a few bits and pieces. But, you know, I've had this experience, you go through your Christmas card list each year, and there are people who have to tick off. There are people who there's been one sad story or another about really, and you don't send them a Christmas card anymore. I came across one uh, lady who's been in praying about this situation, kids and stuff recently, and she was a lady who who um, professed Christian faith but, but was uneasy in church because of what she'd been, and it got very difficult for her to come through the door even in the first place, and then she found it hard because there were skeletons in her cupboard. So you can tell people as much as you like. Christ copes with people with untidy lives who turn from sin and are trusting in him. You can tell them as much as you like. But the religious and the respectable and the self-righteous have often got to them first and just twisted their minds. It just helps sometimes to be able to show such a person that they've got no skeleton in their cupboard quite so ugly as there is in the history of Jesus Christ. The Messiah. Son of David, the son of Abraham. Because Matthew here, stunningly, stunningly.
standing in awkwardly, and you can just see gasps around the room, shows the level of human imperfection, the lack of neatness and tidiness that God copes with with the human ancestors of Christ. Oh, what he's got to do is this. Outstanding. He's remarkable. He's off the scale. <clears throat> a couple of reasons. Ken Bailey, uh, who's written a lot about the Middle East and the Bible, uh, Ken Bailey, in his book in 2008, he says, Middle Eastern genealogies are expected to be lists of men. Ecclesi Ecclesiasticus famously begins, let us now praise famous men, and then does so. The genealogies in the Old Testament, lists of men, generally speaking. Luke 3, 23-38, contains a genealogy of Jesus which is exclusively male in character. So biblically and in the wider culture, genealogies include only men, those in 1 Chronicles, again, the exemplifies that. So the unexpected appearance of four women in Matthew's Gospel draws particular attention to that fact. There are women in this genealogy. What's that about? They stick out like, you know, I'd like to say, like glistening gems against a, a more seedy background. But, but frankly, you can't say that because of the four women that are picked out. And again, that's part of Matthew's point here. Had Matthew merely meant to evoke women in the history of Israel in a general way, to say girls are allowed as well, you'd have expected him to have named you know, real matriarchal heroes in Israel. You'd have expected him to cite um, Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel. Again, women like Mary, whose who, wounds got miraculously opened than they had kids. But instead he names four women whose primary link appears to be their unacceptability to the religious people. Women with Gentile ancestry or very close Gentile associations that are deemed to be wrong, and are obviously a fairly, a fairly dodgy past for most of them. Tamar, Canaan, Rahab of Jericho, Ruth the Moabite woman, and the ex wife of Uriah the Hittite. Why on earth? Why on earth, writing for his predominantly Jewish readers, does Matthew mention these four shocking to them women? This monstrous regiment of women. Yeah. John Knox. Well done. First of all, it was Tamar, verse 3. Somebody want to read this bit of verse 3? <coughs> Due to the father of Perez and Zechariah, his mother was Tamar. Mm. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. So he's just going neatly through his letter. You can see that. As you can neatly through his, it was a father and father of Pigat, 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 Pigat. Whoa, what's that woman doing there? Oh, what? What a move. What Taylor? What? Are you, are you sure? Can her blurn? Honestly? Foul the inheritance of the, of the Messiah? He just, it's the way these guys are going to work, you know? He's working to some very religious people with preconceived ideas about these things. Taylor. Married to the eldest of three brothers, he died without having children with him to continue his inheritance in Israel. The land was given to certain families, you only had to continue your inheritance by one means and another. It was the custom then, as described in Deuteronomy 25, 5 10, check it out, for his younger brother to take her on as his wife, which he duly did. The process known as Lever of Marriage. I don't know why, but that's what it is. But then, of course, the younger brother also dies, leaving Tamar in unfortunate circumstances, no children with her. Now, Judah had another son the third brother, but he's too young to take the responsibility seriously. So Judah, the dead husband's father, promises the boy to Tamar when he's going to be old enough. And she waited. She waited. And she waited patiently. But Judah's promise wasn't honoured. So Tamar cooked up a courageous, you have to say it's courageous, plan. What Tamar did was she went and she dressed like a prostitute. But she covered her face so he couldn't recognise her. And then he sat by the side of the road where she knew Judah would be coming past on his ass going somewhere or other. And he saw this girl he thought was a prostitute sitting by the road and he propositioned her. And they negotiated. And her fee was settled as one goat. But he didn't have one on him. So she took his staff and his signet ring as a sort of a deposit and he'll send the goat along later and he'll have a stick back in his ring. 
And in due course, he sent the goat, but the woman was nowhere to be found. Tamar fell pregnant. And word of it came back to Judah, who was furious, and demanded that she be burned for her sin. But just as she was being dragged out to her death by the neighbours, she sent a message to Judah, with his staff and his ring, saying that she was pregnant by the guy who owned these. It was, according to Leviticus 20, an incestuous situation, and verse 12, they should have been stolen before it. But Judah recognised his fault, and the rightness of Tamar's action, and this woman is listed as an ancestor of Jesus, part of God's plan of salvation. Dodgy, isn't it? Sounds like a skeleton in the cupboard. And then verse 5, the second woman in the list is the Gentile woman, Rahab, who's known throughout the scriptures as a harlot. What a dodgy woman. She isn't a Jewish person either, and has had a bit of a dodgy past. She was a citizen of Jericho, first city that God led the Israelites to capture when they entered the promised land. She was to be found amongst the enemies of God. But this Gentile prostitute laid aside her earlier way of life and put her trust in the living God. And Bailey, in his book on this, he calls her a reformed, immoral, Gentile woman with a courageous faith. There's another one. That the religious, the self-righteous of the day, are going to say Pfft. about. Do you see what I mean? And then sit Yes, verse 5, there was Ruth. Hebrew family moved from Bethlehem with their two sons to Moab, where their boys married Moabite women, shouldn't they? And the husband died, and then the boys died, leaving the Israelite widow little option but to come back to Bethlehem, to her own hometown amongst the people of God, because she'd be able to make out a lot better there amongst her own people than she would in Moab. But Ruth, the Moabite house, gentle widow of one of the sons, this woman had lost, she insists on accompanying her mother-in-law back to Bethlehem, famously saying, where you go I will go, where you stay I will stay, your people will be my people and your God my God, where you die I will die and there I will be buried. She's radically left her own people and associated herself with the people of God. And when she gets there, well there's this whole elaborate marriage thing again, there's a relative who you know, is involved and it all gets a bit seedy and dicey and some odd business and Another Gentile woman, unclean in the eyes of the people who are reading, perhaps reading this through, turns from the ways of her past, that of her people, to follow God and to come amongst his people and to join his kingdom. And in spite of her past, finds his mercy and finds his grace. And God doesn't turn up his nose at her. The way the religious establishment of Matthew's day turned up their noses at people like this. And it is precisely ladies like this that are deliberately studied into the genesis of Jesus. Just where they'll smack you in the eye. And perhaps most shockingly of all, the last of these four women in this genealogy had married a Gentile. That was awful. Well, perhaps she was a Gentile woman, but if she had been Jewish, but she married a Gentile guy. That's an awful thing to do. To go marry the wrong guy. Uriah was a Hittite. And Bathsheba, because that was her name, although Matthew doesn't even mention her name, she behaved in a thoroughly reprehensible manner to seduce the king of Israel. Here's how it went. Bathsheba, Matthew doesn't even mention her name, but describes her simply in terms of describing what was wrong about her. She violates every standard of Eastern decency in this story. You know, in the Middle East to this day, famously, men and women are famously very modest when it comes to exposing their bodies, you know, like wrists and things. Cold. Here's a story in 1 Samuel 11 and 12. Bathsheba waits until her husband's away fighting the king's wars, then takes a bath on her rooftop facing the palace. It's a bit obvious, it's a bit blatant, it's a bit more blatant than you might realise. Two reasons for that. In those days, very few people's houses, apart from the very, very rich, had more than a single floor. They all lived in sort of, not bungalows, but one floor, you know, ground floor dwellings. If you're a rich house, might have two floors. Possibly, if you're very rich, you might have three floors. Richer people's houses were higher than all lowly souls, so they overlooked everyone else's houses and couldn't be overlooked in their own. 
Good point. More than that, houses were built very close together within the walls of cities like Jerusalem in those days. Because there wasn't the space and there was a lot of people and they were all built cheap by Joel. You go walk through some of those old cities that remained and they didn't see the point. They built right together. Bailey's done some work on it. He reckons they couldn't have been more than 20 feet between where David was living and where Bathsheba was living in the absence of her husband. So she takes a bath where she can very much expect to be seen. And David takes a predictable second look that he shouldn't have taken. And after he's taken the look, he takes the hook and she gets pregnant. And Uriah the Hittite is killed in the war to try and cover up his tracks as David orders the troops to retreat from him when he's in the thick of a battle. And Samuel picks it up confronts David with what's happened. And David repents of his sin in language that's recorded for us in Psalm 51. It's a big moral blot on the life of David and on the history of Israel. And Jesus had a woman in his Genesis with a history like that. So given the dodgy associations of so many of their religious leaders and heroes of whom they were proud, with people like these, there was no point any of the Jews of Matthew's day objecting to Jesus on the ground of his paternity or parentage, but look at these people that are in there. Look at how God accepts and receives sinners who turn back to him. And the list concludes with Mary. Bright, faithful, lowly, peasant girl, who would not have impressed the religious people of her day very highly at all. And she turns out to be the one who God chose to be the mother of the Messiah. I have cost her. See, she trusts God on the basis of the message of the angel. She accepts that her pregnancy is a miracle. Very unlikely the villagers living all around her would believe her story. And even Joseph, her intended, found it very hard to believe at first. Why do you think Joseph took Mary with him when he went up to Bethlehem to register? She wasn't required to go. Why do you think he took his pregnant intended and if not his baby with him? Because, because what would the villagers do to that girl when he wasn't there to protect her and look after her? They'd drag her out and stone her because that's what they were about. received that message from the angel, she responded, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. She humbly accepted the discipleship that she knew would bring her shame in the eyes of her community. How wrong is cool Christianity? She accepts. She accepts the shame in the eyes of those people who would very likely want to stone her to death. So why then does Matthew include these women? Clearly because God does. He includes men and women who know they don't come up to the mark, but who turn from their former way of life and sign up for the kingdom of God. They are accepted. Part of the plan to which God is moving the whole of human history to send Jesus to be the Savior of the world. And they are Jewish and Gentile, both of which God includes in his coming kingdom. Who does God include in his coming kingdom? He includes those who are socially underprivileged, the women. He includes people who haven't made good choices in their lives, but are making better ones now. Look at the immorality, look at the look at the human flotsam and jetsam that's there. And with such a list, Matthew gives us an indication of the kind of people that Messiah came to save. So just exactly who are his people of verse 21? 
Give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Who are they going to be, Matthew? Who are you going to describe to us as being his people in the rest of your gospel? Not, precisely not those that the religious people of his day thought. But those who had lives that were messy. Those who had lives that were marginalized. Who had turned from sin and trusted Christ. And are therefore utterly accepted amongst the people of God. I think Matthew started his book pretty well. You see. He's certainly given the people of his day, the people of his culture, a reason to sit up. 